So last week, we list, I'm just going to quickly list the rights that are guaranteed that we went through. The first was right to be informed of the charges made against you. The second, having an adequate time and facilities to prepare a defense. Then the right to counsel, right to translation and interpretation, a right to call and examine witnesses, a right to be presumed innocent, and a right to remain silent the right to be tried by a fair and impartial court, and the right to a public trial. And finally, the right to be present at your um, own trial. The next right that is guaranteed in order for there to be a fair trial is a right to a speedy trial. And I have a question from somebody uh, who sent me about um, uh, their partner, and it clearly is a violation of this um, that uh, Victor sent me. Okay. Um, the right to a speedy trial is guaranteed under Article 14 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. It states, in the determination of any criminal charge against him, everyone shall be entitled to the following minimum guarantees in full equality, to be tried without undue delay. The right to be tried without undue delay aims to avoid keeping defendants too long in an uncertainty about their fate. The right also serves the interest of justice as unduly lengthy trials may jeopardize the effectiveness and credibility of the administration of justice since the availability and quality of evidence may deteriorate with time. And the right is important for persons in detention to ensure that such depriv deprivation of liberty does not, la not last longer than necessary. So especially if somebody's being held in prison rather than you know, in their own homes free to prepare their defense. Indeed, prolonged pretrial detention may constitute arbitrary detention. Um, and that's something for the individual who wrote to Victor to think about. Um, is there a delay? These are the indicators if you're monitoring or you're involved in a trial. Um, is there a delay in the start of the trial of one year or more since the arrest or charging of a defendant? There is no time to, uh, is there time to, uh, is there proof of a definitive delay? There have been delays of six months that have been held to be undue. In other circumstances where these factors cut the other way, a period of 11 years was not was found not to be undue because of complexity, et cetera. I mean, 11 years would be an extreme and, I, and I'm not sure what case that was, but you have to look at the individual case. If the case is extremely complicated and you have witnesses all over the world, um, you have evidence uh, and, and it, let's say it's a crime that has been going on for 20 years, that would of course result in a longer time for um, between a charging and a trial. Are there multi no, multiple defendants? Of course, if there are many people being tried, it lasts, uh, the trial lasts longer and the preparation for trial lasts longer. Uh, to make sure that each individual gets a fair trial requires coordination uh, among the defendants and also among the prosecutor, and that can add to complexity. Has the defendant requested the delay? So this has happened many times that the defendant is not able to prepare uh, the case before um, the trial date. So the defendant sometimes requests a delay. In that case, it's not a question of undue delay. Is he being detained before trial? Um, so you have to watch as the court monitor or as the person involved in the, in the trial, all of these different factors. The effect of the delay on the de defendant is relevant. That's where there would be a prejudice to the defendant or where the defendant is being held in detention during the period of the trial, the defendant must be tried as quickly as possible. The right to a speedy trial is all the more important where the defendant is deprived of their liberty, meaning they're held in prison. The UN Human Rights Committee has specifically stated that where the defendant is denied bail by the court, the defendant must be tried in an expeditious, expeditious as ma a manner as possible. So if there's no way for the individual to get out of prison by paying bail um, or uh, having some sort of pretrial detention at home rather than in prison, it becomes even more essential that the trial happens quickly. Um, Victor, I think somebody has um, like their phone on or their, or their um, they're not silent. 
Oh, um, oh, all right. Thank you for addressing. <laughs> I'll, I'll look and make sure to mute everyone. Okay. No, it's good. Um, so is this case being held in, um, in an international court or is there an international aspect to the case? Again, this can take longer um, time. Is the case factually complex? Again, as I said, if it it's if the crimes have been going on for a long time, if it's international, it will be a longer time to prepare the case. Are there a long time uh, that nothing has happened? Has the person been held in detention and there's no filings, no motions, and years are passing? This is a big serious sign for anybody monitoring or helping a defendant um, that something's going wrong. That means the prosecution is sitting on the case. Is the defendant prejudiced? Prejudice in this context means harm to the defendant's case or the defendant themselves. For instance, if the defendant's health is declining and deteriorating. Uh, if an important witness is dying because of the delay being so long, these are considerations, especially where the pre prejudice is irreversible, such as the potential death of an, um, an important witness. So these are all factors to look in. Has the period been so long that things are affecting the case? Evidence is disappearing, witnesses are disappearing. These are all violations of the right to a speedy trial. Rights that must be guaranteed in order for there to be a fair trial, not to be subject to double double jeopardy. Um, this is um, in all courts. Uh, I know, I think probably if anybody watches US films or watches like OJ Simpson trial, I was living in Europe when this happened. People are like, what? He can't be tried a second time. He, the, the prosecution can't appeal. In the United States, it's a very serious right to double jeopardy, in which case a decision for murder trial cannot be appealed uh, by the prosecutor. But this right is a right that goes beyond that US right. This is concerning specific final decisions in every court, in Europe, in Russia, and everywhere in the world, in Africa. This right provides that one shall be liable to be tried or punished again for an offense of which they've already been finally convicted or acquitted in accordance with the law and penal procedure of a country. Therefore, if somebody has reached the final level of a court in their country and they've been found innocent, there is no way to then again file charges based on the same set of facts, on the same crime. There are three requirements for du the double jeopardy rule to attach. The prior charges have to have been criminal. The prior proceedings must have been final, meaning it's gone to the furthest appeal, and the offense must have been the same. So the rules also only apply to trials within the same country, but it also covers all kinds of courts within that country. So for example, um, we've had this before, um, I think uh, in the cases of this Epstein, Ma Maxwell things, these um, sexual uh, abuse of children cases, these people are being prosecuted and indicted in the US, UK, France, wherever the crimes have occurred. Um, so that doesn't matter. You can be found guilty in the US and then be tried again for the, on the basis of those crimes, if they occurred in the UK as well. Um, so then there can be another um, trial. So that doesn't violate the double jeopardy. So very simple indicator. Was the defendant previously fi uh, finally convicted or um, uh, acquitted for an offense? And I forgot to give the, um, the law for this. This is again, Article 14 of the International Covenant on Civil Political Rights. No one shall be liable to be tried or punished again for an offense for which he has already been finally convicted or acquitted in accordance with the law or penal procedure of the, of the um, of each country. And this does not apply to retrials. If it is found that the trial was not fair, um, a re if there's something wrong, for example, jury selection went wrong or something went wrong with the evidence and there's a determination there needs to be a retrial, that is possible and does not violate um, the right to um, be, uh, to be uh, free from double jeopardy. So the right to a reasoned and public judgment. This comes from International Covenant of Civil P Political Rights, Article 14. Any judgment render rendered 
in a criminal case or in a suit at law shall be made public, except for the interest of juvenile persons otherwise. So unless you're dealing with a child, um, the decision in a court has to be made public. Um, this means uh, public uh, publish publication in a newspaper, in front of the courthouse, in some way that um, needs to be um, issued. The right to a reasoned public judgment is the key to a defendant's ability to challenge their conviction. After all, if they don't know why they were found guilty, they won't be able to lodge an effective appeal. It also provides a needed transparency. So what is clear here is that when it, a court makes it public, makes the judgment public, it has to state the reasons for that judgment. It has to say, this person violated this um, law, we have found this based on these reasons, so that the defendant is able to lodge an appeal based on the reasons that were given for the conviction. Indicators. So what do you look for when you're examining a trial and you suspect that the public, uh, that the judgment wasn't um, a reasoned public judgment? You look whether the defendant was found guilty or not for each specific charge and what basis. You need to know the basis of the decision. Whether the judge referred to the relevant law and whether the judge referred to the evidence in the case file and or presented in court to justify that finding. Whether the judgment was in writing, whether the judgment was duly reasoned. The sentence imposed on the defendant, if he or she was convicted and whether this entails the death penalty. Death penalty is, is, is um, uh, everything that we've been talking about uh, up until now and throughout this whole presentation, when you have a case that brings in the issue of death penalty, it raises this level to a maximum. You really have to make sure that everything has been, every box has been ticked um, and nothing has gone wrong because of the punishment being the severest. I would put into that category as well, life imprisonment. Um, whether the judgment and sentence, if any, were made public. The UN Human Rights Committee said that where judgments are not handed down in writing, the committee feels unable to accept that the proceedings against the defendant amounted to a fair trial, as a judgment handed down in writing was not made public. So it is essential that it is, it, it is published somewhere and, and hopefully handed um, and made available to the defendant. the right to appeal. The right to appeal ensures that there is more than one level of judicial scrutiny. The right to appeal thus reduces the risk that a conviction that resulted from errors of law or fact or entailed violations of the defendant's fair trial rights will become final. final. Again, International Covenant for Civil and Political Rights lays out in Article 14, everyone convicted of a crime shall have the right to his conviction and sentence being reviewed by a higher tribunal according to law. The UN Human Rights Committee requires that the higher court be able fully to review the conviction and sentence of the defendant. The, European, the, U, the United Nations Human Rights Committee stated, the right to have one's conviction and sentence reviewed by a higher tribunal imposes on the state party a duty to review sub substantively, both on the basis of sufficiency of the evidence and of the law, the conviction and sentence, such, as the, such that the procedure allows for due consideration of the nature of the case. A review that is limited to the formal or legal aspects of the conviction, conviction without any consideration whatsoever of the facts is not sufficient. So if a decision is made and, and issued and it doesn't state the reasoning, the, the basis of the facts that it was based on and just states this is the law that was violated, the UN Human Rights Committee has held that that is not, um, that that does not meet the fair trial standard. The right to appeal. The right to appeal ensures that there is more than one level of judicial scrutiny. The appeal reduces the risk of a conviction that resulted from errors of law or fact or entailed violations of the defendant's um, fair trial rights. 
uh, that could become final. What, now, what do you look at if you're a monitor or if you're involved in a trial? Whether the right to an appeal was available to the defendant, and whether the defendant was informed of that right. In some systems, the prosecutor can also appeal an acquittal or the sentence if he, is, uh, he or she believes it to be insufficient. So there are cases where the prosecutor can say the person was given too low um, a level and then he, can, uh, he or she can then appeal. Whether the system in which you're working allows prosecutors to appeal and if such an appeal is lodged. So if a prosecutor, um, as, as I mentioned in the U US cannot um, appeal a, a criminal uh, decision in a murder trial. Um, that is possible in Europe. So you have to look uh, specifically at the system that you're working in. You have to know what the laws are in Russia and whether it allows um, the appeals um, to go through on, on certain specific um, cases. If not, you have to prohibit um, the prosecution from making, you have to file a complaint that the um, prosecution is not allowed to appeal in certain instances. Rights that must be guaranteed for there to be a fair trial. And um, when we first met um, prior to the start of this, there was um, discussion um, uh, by one, one of the people who was, who's, who was involved in this training today, I believe, about proper conditions for confinement and that she's working on issues of detention. Um, so there are very specific um, rules on this. Uh, concerning the conditions of confinement, you need to be alert uh, to the ways in which conditions of confinement may affect fair trial rights. For instance, if your defendant is not able to adequately prepare for their trial, that's immediately affecting their right to defend themselves and to have a fair trial. And you should always report as a court monitor or somebody in fair trial, um, torture or cruel treatment um, to your, um, especially if you're working with a, an international CSO, NGO, um, working in human rights, you should um, immediately report that. So the right uh, to uh, proper confinement is established in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Article 10. All persons deprived of their liberty shall be treated with human humanity and with respect for the inherent dig dignity of the human person. What are the proper conditions of confinement? Detention of an individual before trial must be the exception rather than the rule. So what the international standard is hoping and pushing for is that um, you are going to be able to defend yourself um, in freedom, to be defending yourself from your home, perhaps have an ankle bracelet that detects your monitors, but that is the ideal um, under the international rules. But it might be necessary to prevent flight, interference with evidence or recurrence of the crime that an individual is held and in, um, held in prison. In those instances, pretrial detention must be based on an individualized determination that is reasonable and necessary, taking into account all the circumstances. Individuals should never be the subject to conditions amounting to torture or to cruel, inhumane, or degrading treatment, but also because a defendant's conditions of detention may bear on their right to a fair trial. So you have two issues here. There is a human right that you should be, should be protected from torture, cruel, and humane uh, degrading treatment. And you have a second issue, which is, is this treatment in any way affecting their ability to defend themselves and to have a fair trial? Indicators. The conditions of the defendant's detention before and or during trial. So if you're working with a defendant or you are um, uh, uh, representing him, you should be aware of how is he being held? Is he held only in solitary confinement? That that's affects the, the mental health, all these different things. That's something you have to look at and monitor and take note of. Any claim that the defendant is being treated different, differently on the basis of his race, religion, political affiliation. So if you have a certain political position and you're being treated differently than other people who are um, being detained, that's something to note and take account of. Disability uh, or sexual orientation or gender identity or any other such grounds. For if there's something specific about the individual that's making him, uh, making the state 
treat him differently, that should definitely be taken um, account of if it's uh, negatively affecting them. Whether the defendant has been subjected to solitary confinement and the circumstances, duration, and reasons for any such confinement. Um, there, I'm going to go into something about that specifically called the Mandela rules. The solitary confinement is extremely dangerous to an individual. You have to look at the length of time that they're held in solitary confinement and the conditions. Are they able to go out? Are they able to see you know, the sky um, to be out in air at least some point if it's a prolonged confinement? And what are the reasons for this? Is this person such a risk to other people that it's necessary? Or is this being done to punish them and to weaken in them um, before trial, in which case they're clearly violating a right to fair trial. Any health condition the defendant has. Um, we talked about the Magnitsky case, uh, what happened there. there. That has to be taken into consideration. If the defendant has um, medical condition, they have to be treated and receive adequate medical care. So I'm going to go very quickly. The standards um, of the confinement um, and imprisonment are uh, established by the United Nations under the Mandela rules that comes from Nelson Mandela. Um, they were established the 17th of December, 2015. UN standard for minimum treatment for, of prisoners. This is now considered the lowest level of treatment. So, you know, this is the basic that the UN is requiring for how you detain and hold prisoners. 122 rules that cover all aspects of prison management and outline the agreed minimum standards for the treatment of prisoners, whether pretrial or convicted. There, these rules have been um, supplemented by UN Bangkok rules on um, the treatment of female prisoners. I don't cover that during this training. We're just going to look at the basics um, with the Mandela rules. And again, this is a summary. Prisoners must be treated, rules one through five, prisoners must be treated with respect for their inherent dignity and value as human beings. Torture and ill treatment is prohibited. Prisoners should be treated according to their needs without discrimination. The purpose of prison is to protect society and reduce reoffending. It is not to punish an individual or to make him unable to defend himself. The safety of prisoners, staff, service providers, and visitors are at all times paramount. So they have a right to see um, staff um, um, have assistance. Allocation 59, the rules require prisoners to be housed close to their home facil uh, to facil facilitate, facilitate social, social rehabilitation. I was just trying to do this quickly. So um, the uh, closer they are to their families, to getting jobs afterwards, this is considered very important. So sending somebody from Moscow to Siberia <laughs> is completely a violation of this Mandela rule. Registration, rules seven to eight, information that should be collected and entered into the prisoner file now includes names, location, family, so that any injuries or complaints about prior ill treatment can be reported. Information, they must be given information about the prison regime. They must know how to access legal advice in a language and a manner that they understand. Prisoners' property, they have to be allowed to have their property in safe custody along with an inventory. Medical screening, they have a right to be screened as soon as they arrive to detect if they have any medical condition that will have to be watched and monitored and cared for while they're in prison. Categoriz categorization, certain groups of prisoners must be housed se separately as a means of protection and to facilitate adequate individual treatment. This applies to men and women, pretrial convicted prisoners, children and adults. For example, children should not be housed with adults. Women should be housed separately. For example, if there's um, issues in the, in, in the country um, or in the prison with treatment of LGBTQ, that's also uh, something that can be considered, um, uh, putting them in separate um, facilities so that they're not abused. Um, it hasn't been um, in terms of political positions. There, it's, I have not read anything about housing uh, people with political views um, separately in, in terms of protecting them in prison. An individual assessment is important uh, to identify any risk prisoners may pose to themselves, to staff or other prisoners, but also risk that they might be exposed to, specific needs they might have, and rehabilitation measures that should be taken. Classification systems should be flexible in order 
uh, to support the individualization of treatment. Special needs, you have to make, um, uh, the prison should be taking it into account any special needs, physical, mental, or otherwise uh, to, for, for the prisoner. Standardized prisoner file management system so that all information is kept so on record so that there is no surprise that this person has just died of some condition or there's no surprise that you know that this person hasn't been allowed to see their lawyer because they're being held in a certain part of the country that they don't have access to their lawyer all of this should be transparent and open hopefully on electronic database information each file should in, in include information on the whole range of issues from their personal data their um, requests uh, classification requests for classification disciplinary sanctions medical files all of that should be kept separately and confidentially and made accessible to the prisoner and to his attorney hygiene basic hygiene. And this is something if you're monitoring or working with the defendant, you should see that there's water, that they have clean bedding, that they have the basic sanitary conditions and hyg hygienic conditions are met, that they have food. Um, and food meaning that not just eating bread every day, but eating uh, something that is balanced enough so that their um, health and their um, mental capability to defend themselves in court and to stand trial isn't diminished sleeping. If, accommod if accommodation is cell-based, there's supposed to be under um, the Mandela rules, one prisoner per cell. Um, but when there's, there should be, um, if there's multiple prisoners in dormitories, there should be um, a selection process where they decide who is put together. Um, there should be proper heating, vent ventilation, air, light, and minimum floor, floor space provided. Children, decision on whether children are accommodating prison with their parent is based on the best interest of the child. And if uh, you're working with a woman who's pregnant, that has to also be taken into consideration how she's held and um, her conditions. Discipline and sanctions, information. The rules recognize that understanding rights and obligations is key for day-to-day -day prison management. A, def a defendant, a person in prison has to promptly upon their arrival know what the rules are and not be sanctioned after because he didn't know what the rules are. They have to be provided this information in understandable language and format. Procedures for searches must be laid down in law or regulation and any decision on whether to conduct a search um, must, whether it's, it be, must be based on whether it's ne necessary and proportionate. Search procedures must respect the dignity and, and um, privacy of the prisoner. It should not be used to harass or intimidate. Invasive body searches should be the last resort. Searches of visitors at a minimum must be subject to the same safeguard as searches of prisoners and take account of their status as non-prisoners. So if, if you're a lawyer going in to see your, your um, defendant who's in prison, you should not be ex uh, uh, searched in a way that violates your privacy or um, violates the respect for your dignity. Again, the rules on solitary confinement, um, going back to this, because this is extremely important. It should never take, it should not uh, be more than 15 days. For some groups, uh, women, uh, it's pro especially if they're pregnant or breastfeeding, uh, solitary confinement is prohibited under the United Nations rules. Um, the rules define solitary confinement as confinement for more than 22 hours per day without meaningful human contact. Interpretation of meaningful human contact should recognize the suffering that any person will experience if isolated or deprived of contact with human beings. Disciplinary offenses. The rules outline procedures and safeguards that should be um, in place uh, to, the rules outline procedures and safeguards that should be in place to respond to allegations of disciplinary offense. Laws or regulations must clearly define what is a disciplinary offense in prison. Any sanction has to be proportionate to the act. The application of disciplinary sanctions must be recorded. Again, jumping back to what we just spoke about in the start of the Mandela rules, 
everything has to be reported from their entry into prison to their health to every single time they're sanctioned and the reasons for their, them being sanctioned. The use of alternative dispute resolution mechanisms is encouraged. Um, and when the interests of the justice require, particularly in cases involving serious disciplinary charges, prisoners must be able to defend themselves in person or through legal assistance. So if possible, um, they should have the right to call a lawyer to assist them if they're being disciplined unfairly. Instruments of restraint that are inherently degrading or painful are prohibited. I think we had a number of cases. I remember we spoke about at the European Court of Human Rights with Russia. Uh, we have also with the Magnitsky case of um, uh, 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 handcuffing individuals to their bed or whatever. This is extremely um, prohibited. Um, it's considered painful. Anything that's painful or degrading is prohibited. Um, their use is only legitimate, legitimate if no lesser form of controlling an actual risk is available, and they must be removed as soon as possible. So if the defendant is acting extremely rationally, is hurting other people, there can be cause to restrain them, but it would have to be to that level. And as soon as the person is calm and can move on, he has to be un, unrestrained. Um, they are, uh, as we mentioned before, in terms of getting a fair trial, uh, defendants should not be entering court with their handcuffs on. They should be coming in. They should not be held in prisons in behind cages when they're in court. This is all um, indicators of an unfair trial, um, unfair use of restraints, as well as causing bias um, for the judge and jury and the press. Um, use of force. Except in cases of self-defense or attempted escape, staff should not use force on prisoners. Any use of force must not exceed what is strictly necessary and should be subsequently reported. Only in exceptional cases should prison and staff be armed. UN standards also require strict regulation on the use of force and that arbitrary use of, um, arbitrary or abuse of the use of force is, should be considered a crime and be punishable as a criminal offense family and friends, they should have a right to see, receive visits and contact their friends by phone or letter. Um, it should never be restricted as, for, as a form of discipline. Legal representative, they should have adequate opportunity, time and confidential facilities. And I think that was discussed before when we discussed um, the right to a lawyer, that you should have a private area that's not being recorded, that's not being watched by any guards uh, for a defendant to speak to his lawyer and they should have a place that they're able to keep their legal documents. Foreign nationals have a right to get in touch with their embassies. Rehabilitation. Prisons should offer educational education training. In the US, that's a big thing um, in terms of libraries, um, education, teachers coming in. Um, work, uh, they should never be allowed to work in a form of that would be considered servitude or slavery. Any work should give a minimal remuneration. The US has this. Prisoners are put to work. They learn, earn very little, but they are remunerated um, for their labor. They cannot work for free because that's considered slavery. Um, providing meaningful activities uh, such as mental health, rehabilitation, exercise, library education. Access to healthcare, number one, that's a big deal. Um, it's, it keeps being repeated here. Uh, it deprives their liberty if they cannot uh, and, and ability to defend themselves if they don't have um, healthcare. Inspections, in recognition that inspections are an integral part of a prof professional prison system, there's a twofold system to be put in place that incur into, includes internal monitoring of the prison system as well as in ex external independent monitoring. The purpose of such monitoring is to ensure that prisons are managed according, in accordance with the laws and regulations and the rules list the authority uh, inspectors should have and uh, clarify the reporting and follow-up procedures. So it's very important that um, the prisoner, the, the person running the prison is ensuring that there's an inspection and that there is a greater inspection, um, in, be it from the, from the state or from international, um, if it's, we haven't even begun to discuss like prisoners of war, but there has to be some sort of external um, organization, either the state or an international group um, inspecting the prisons. Mental rule summary, investigations. 
prisoners must report any death in custody, disappearance, serious injury, uh, and if they believe um, that torture or inhumane treatment may have incurred, uh, irrespective of a formal complaint. So if you're working with an individual and he hasn't filed a complaint, but you see evidence of anything such as this, such as injury, um, torture, you have to report it immediately to an independent authority. Um, uh, I know this is difficult, um, but it should be somebody within the state. For instance, in the U.S., you would go to the U.S. Attorney's Office where the, where the prison is being held or to the state authority. Um, but if it's not possible, it's always uh, uh, something to report it to, for example, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, um, and make it public um, that there's um, some violation going on. Everything that's taken from the prisoner has to be returned to him um, when he's released. Opportunities should be made to reintegrate back into the society. So that was all concerning the treatment on um, prisoners. Now dealing with juveniles, so anybody under 18 uh, and vulnerable, vulnerable groups. Certain defendants must be afforded special protection. Um, this is not just an individual who's, whose age is under 18, but if they have a mental capacity or intellectual impairment and they're un, it, that it is um, under their age. So under 18, um, if they have the intellectual, if they're 50 years old, but they have the intellectual capacity of a 12 year old, they have to be treated like um, and protected as if they're a juvenile. Indicators. What is the age of the defendant? International standards state that 12 is the lowest acceptable minimal age for criminal responsibility. And that's not the true in, in the US, it's a higher age, but depending on the crime and, and on the child, it can go lower than 18, but 12 is extremely um, young, uh, but that is the international standard. Is the child defendant able to participate and express themselves freely? Do they have a parent or guardian who should be informed? Does he understand, he or she understand the charges against them? Um, and what was the time between the charge and the trial? Has the trial been closed and the child's name hidden again? This is the one exception that it's come up over and over. When you have somebody who is a child, the trial is not supposed to be made public. The trial is not supposed to be published publicly. The name is supposed to be redacted, removed from documents. For a disabled person, has there additional protections been taken to help someone with a minimal um, ability to stand trial? Specific. For a disabled person, have there been additional protections? Is the individual fit to stand trial? If blind or deaf, have materials been provided in a manner that the defendant can um, understand? Rights that must be guaranteed for a fair trial, a jury trial. This is not universal. The right to a fair trial in international law does not entail a right to be tried by a jury. A domestic court's failure to guarantee a defendant the option to be tried by a jury where the right exists in national law, so in the United States and in the United Kingdom, does not necessarily violate the right to a fair trial under international law. So if you're in a system that doesn't um, provide jury trials, not having one is clearly not a violation. So you have to, if you are working with a jury, you have to see the biases towards a defendant. You have to be very careful in selection. In the United States, they have people whose profession it is to work with um, defense teams in um, assessing and picking tri uh, jurors. Is there a prior relationship? And has the judge responded or does the judge have any connection with the uh, defendant, with the, with, the, with the jury? Um, death penalty. So in death penalty cases, it's more important that the defendant have a fair trial than ever because it constitutes a violation of right to life. Death penalty is the only imposed for the most serious crimes. In Europe, there is no death penalty and in the United States, there is. Uh, international courts, there is no death penalty. Indicators, has it been imposed? Was it a final judgment? Is it being imposed upon somebody who's under 18? Um, 
what was the law at the time of the commission. So if crimes were committed and there's no death penalty, and then there's a change in the law, for example, if Russia makes it a death penalty for this and this, then the crimes that occurred before that cannot, those individuals cannot receive the death penalty. Is the imposition of the death penalty contrary to the uh, provisions of the International Covenant of Civil Pro Pro Political Rights um, and of the Convention of Prevention of the Crime of Genocide? Is a foreign national facing the death uh, penalty? Has he been granted access to um, consular assistance? So how, basically, has he been able to present a fair defense, meet with his lawyer, um, informed of advanced uh, that, he, that death penalty is a possibility in his case? Was there a sufficient time between the sentence and the execution? Because that is where the most number of appeals um, in the United States, you can ask for clemency of your governor. Um, has the decision been received within a reasonable period of time prior to their execution? derogations and national security. And this is a very specific one. Um, I'm sure that it's in Russia now and has been in the United States for a very long time where national security makes it essential to deny somebody their rights. That is the basis of that decision. Now we're gonna look at how international law treats this and whether this is allowed. In times of public emergency, which threatens the life of the nation and existence which is officially proclaimed, the state parties to the present covenant may take measures derogating from their obligations to, uh, under the present covenant, gov covenant to the extent strictly required by the exigencies of the situation. This, this is a very dangerous uh, exemption because if it's claimed um, and we, you can just look at the United States on um, people being held for decades um, because of 9-11 um, being denied due process because of national security. This is extremely rare. A state of emergency can be declared only if there is a public emergency which threatens the life of the nation. An exceptional and grave threat to the nation, such as the use of threat of force, such as war, terrorism, the state must inform other states and have officially proclaimed a state of an emergency. The state must ensure the derogation is necessary and that the derogation, mean, meaning the exemption from the international protections for the individual's right to fair trial, they have to um, ensure that it's necessary and proportional and must provide remedies for the violations, even during the state of uh, emergency. So the first thing you check is, has the state in, immediately informed other states through the UN Secretary General that there is a state of emergency? Has the state officially proclaimed a state of emergency? Has the state ensured derogations from fundamental human rights are necessary? For example, um, you have a group of individuals who are considered terrorists, they're being locked up, they're not giving, being given immediate trial or immediate access to lawyers because the, the country's under attack. Are derogations proportional and reasonable um, in light of the particular emergency? Does this state provide effective remedies to the victims of human rights violations? Even uh, those who are victims of an excessive, excessive or wrongful application of emergency measures. So if something has gone wrong, can they sue the state? Can they say I was held in detention for a year because I was incorrectly identified a terrorist? Can he file a claim against the state? Has the state provided justification, not only for their claim to proclaim a state of emergency, but for specific measures? Uh, based on that proclamation, is the right non derogable Certain rights that are absolute and states can never derogate from such rights, such as the right to life and freedom from slavery and torture. Okay, this clearly, um, if, if anybody, anybody here has read about the Guantanamo um, situation, there were violations of this. So there are certain rights that you're, you're never, never to be tortured. Um, and the United States in, in, uh, created a legal loophole, which exempted them from that, um, saying that these were non-alien combatants. These were people who did not fall under any state because they were under uh, 
they were fighting for ISIS or for terrorism, um, Al Qaeda, all of this, these were all the reasons that the US found that they did not have to um, provide them these rights under international law. Um, I think, as most people know, um, that is considered a violation of the law. Um, and uh, there's, I can, if anybody's interested in how the uh, defense at, reacted to this in Guantanamo and how people who have been defending people whose human rights have been violated by the United States. Um, there's a man called General Baker. He was in charge of the defenses and he has written a lot on, on the challenges he faced and, and stated that these individuals' rights um, were violated. Um, okay, I'm gonna stop share. Uh, take any questions on this, and then we will jump quickly to a discussion on um, what is going on in Ukraine. So the crimes that um, are being uh, assessed, um, and right now there's a lot of people, um, including the International Criminal Court, that has opened an investigation. Um, the US government has a big um, team as well, working on um, gathering information about these crimes. But these are the crime, these are the violations, the violations of the Geneva Conventions, violations of the Hague Conventions, customary international law, customary international law I'll get into, but that you should uh, consider the general standards that every nation considers uh, to be the law of armed conflict violation of the UN Charter, the crime of aggression. This is a big one. Um, so we will discuss that one probably the most. The Geneva Convention. Okay, so the uh, Geneva Convention was signed by, just move. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, the Geneva Convention was signed by the Soviet Union in 1949. Oh my. I'm trying to move that because I can't see the top of my presentation, but the um, additional protocol one to the 1949 Geneva Convention was ratified by the Soviet Union Supreme Council in 1989. In October 14th, 2019, the UN recognized Russia's violation of the Geneva Conventions in Crimea. On November 2019, what Russia withdrew from additional protocol to the Geneva Conventions on the protection of victims of international armed conflict. The law recalls the statement made by the USSR upon ratification of the additional protocol in 1949 concerning the protection of um, victims of international armed conflict. So <clears throat> once the UN stated that the um, attacks in Crimea, Crimea were a violation of the Geneva Convention, Russia responded by withdrawing from the protocols that protect victims of international armed conflict. Some are saying this was a precursor and they knew what is happening now was going to happen. I don't know um, if that's true or not, but this is definitely um, was their attempt um, at this point to start moving away from the Geneva Convention. The Russian Federation withdrew from its obligation to protect, assist the wounded and sick both military and civilian, regardless of which party they belong to. So they didn't withdraw from the entire Geneva Convention, just this protocol, regardless of which party they belong to, to prevent attacks on medical units, personnel, to ensure the protection of civilian population. So they've withdrawn from that protection of the Geneva Convention. The clergy, uh, so priests, um, uh, rabbis, um, as well as other persons uh, under the protection of the convention. Russia does not recognize the article of the additional protocol to the convention, which enshrines the UN Special Commission as a judicial body, which has the right to judge the state for violating the rights um, of civilians in war. So it, it, this all was triggered by the claims by the UN Special Commission that Russia was violating the Geneva Convention. And so now they've also withdrawn all recognition of the UN Special Commission. And Ukraine ratified the US, um, ratified the Geneva Convention uh, as part of the USSR that transferred to them as when they became an independent country and they have not withdrawn uh, in any form or any part of the Geneva Convention. So what are these? protections. 
uh, Article 51, uh, the protection of victims of international armed, uh, armed conflict, the civilian population enjoys general protection against danger arising from hostilities and must not be attacked. Never are civilians to be directly um, the focus of a military operation. Attacks on non-military facilities are expressly prohibited. This article concerns civilian objects, all objects which are not military objectives, stating that such objects cannot be attacked. Um, having worked in uh, on the war crimes in the former Yugoslavia, when a uh, civilian object is used, for example, if um, uh, there was a uh, case in Mostar where the bridge had enormous historical and was considered um, a historical landmark. If it was being used for military purposes, it could not be protected. If a school, if there are no children in that school, the children have all been removed and it is now being filled with um, munitions, then that is a violation um, by the parties on the ground by the parties who are being attacked and the party attacking the building um, is not liable. So if a civilian object is being used for military purposes, this obligation disappears. But if it is a, a, an apartment building, a home, a maternity hospital, that is a clear violation of the Geneva Convention. Persons taking no active part in the hostilities must be treated humanely without any adverse distinction. So if you occupy uh, an area uh, militarily, you cannot start treating those individuals. Um, you cannot start imprisoning them, treating them badly. Those civilians have to be treated as if this is it, it completely humanely um, and allowed to basically live their lives. This prohibits taking any measure to cause physical suffering or extermination. Civilian hospitals organized to give care to the wounded and sick, the infirm and maternity may in no circumstances be the object of the attack, but shall at all times be respected and protected by the parties to the conflict. Use of weapons that cause superfluous injury or unnecessary suffering, as well as um, means of warfare that cause widespread long-term and severe um, damage to the natural environment are prohibited. There is discussion of thermobatic um, weaponry, which are these, and I can I will pull it up because I have a slide um, that I used in a different presentation. These are enormous sort of, let's say cannons in a historical way with hundreds of places that shoot out. It doesn't just attack the individual, uh, let's say it's attacking a military arsenal. It doesn't just hit the military arsenal. It will hit miles beyond that. Um, same thing with chemical weapons. Anything that causes greater damage um, and affects um, uh, widespread damage and affects greater number of civilians and population is prohibited. Article 51 through 54 of the Geneva Convention outlaw in, outlaws indiscriminate attacks on civilian populations and destruction of food, water, and other materials needed for survival. There is information, of course, coming out that, that their food, there is now um, the situations of distress in terms of food and water. Um, in certain regions. Starvation as warfare is prohibited. I worked on a case, again, it was in Mostar, it was um, the Croatians sealing off the Muslim population and the Muslim population going towards starvation. Um, they, they were able to charge um, the Croatian army, the Croatian Bosnian Croatian army with that for starvation. Hostility against places of worship or cultural significance is prohibited in accord with the Hague Convention. We will get to that now. Um, the Hague Convention is very uh, important in terms of protecting churches, museums, theaters. Um, dams, dikes, nuclear stations may not under any circumstance be attacked. The Hague Convention. Uh, the Hague Convention was drafted in 1899 and 1907, and it lays the foundations of laws and customs of war. The Hague Convention was brought together and created by um, a Russian count in 1899 and 1907 by the Russian Tsar. So this was all um, a movement by the Russian um, that brought together all of Europe um, to sign this. The Hague Convention of 1954 establishes laws protecting cultural property during armed conflict. The um, uh, organization UNESCO 
Moscow was formed out of this, out of the Hague Convention. Both Russia and Ukraine are signatories. <coughs> Article five concerning occupation. This is the Hague Convention of 1945, no, sorry, 1954 that deals with cultural property. Any high contracting party in occupation of the whole or party, part of the territory of another high contracting party shall as far as possible support the competent national authorities in safeguarding and preserving its cultural property. Should it prove necessary to take measures to preserve cultural property, um, and in occupied territory and damaged by military op operations, and should the competent national authorities be unable to take such measures, the occupying power shall as far as possible and in close co cooperation with such authorities, take the most necessary measures of preservation. Any high contracting party whose government is considered their legitimate government by members of resistance government movement shall if possible draw their attention to the obligation to comply with these provisions of the convention dealing with respect for cultural property. Cultural property is consistently attacked. It was prosecuted. Um, the attacks on Jewish cultural property were prosecuted um, at, at Nuremberg. Um, uh, the um, attack on cultural property was um, prosecuted in Bosnia. The Serbian and Croatian armies both attacked Muslim uh, Jami uh, um, uh, places of worship. Um, in Croatia, the uh, historic city of Dubrovnik was shelled and it was a UNESCO proper uh, uh, protected cultural um, monument that was shelled. Um, and at the time UNESCO was on the ground, so they created a system to uh, monitor all of the damage to that property. Um, in uh, Syria, NATO uh, was monitoring. I worked with a group from NATO and UNESCO to create a training manual so that NATO um, forces would be able to identify what the cultural property is. Uh, cultural property destruction was prosecuted at the International Criminal Court in the situation of Mali in Africa. Um, and uh, international, uh, uh, UNESCO has noted that in the conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenia, uh, Armenian cultural property was um, attacked and the attacks were directed um, towards destroying Armenian churches, um, very old Armenian churches and places of worship. Customary international law, it's a very broad idea um, and customary law itself is a, is a legal concept that if you're not a lawyer, you might not understand, but it's just basically a general understanding by everyone that this is wrong, that this is a violation. And how do they know that generally? Most states, most countries will have specific laws dealing with that issue. Um, there'll be treaties de dealing with that issue and there'll be a history of addressing things as that issue. So at all points under customary international law, um, especially um, Soviet Union being one of the main founders uh, of Nuremberg, of um, the Geneva Convention under customary international law, they would have been aware of um, what makes, what is a violation of international law. So a general and consistent practice of states followed by them from a sense of legal obligation. So whether you're a signatory to that document or not, if, you're, if this has been a part of your um, you're, that you're aware of and that you're signed treaties that agree with that and you've uh, had in your national law and you have um, been involved with this from, there's a historical tie to that, then you, then you fall under customary international law. That means all or nearly all nations consistently follow the practice in question and they must do so because they believe themselves legally bound. And that's a com com uh, concept of, uh, referred to as opinion, opinion juris. So uh, a legal opinion of necessity. Some particularly prevalent rules of customary law can acquire the status of use cogens, which means norms. They become absolutely normal because everybody knows that genocide is wrong. Everybody has within um, their legal history something that identifies that so that there, there can be no derogation from that, no, every every state um, uh, that has signed international treaties that has been part of the United Nations, that is part of um, different international courts, knows that there's a prohibit, prohibit a prohibition against slavery or genocide. Uh, 
So for a particular area of customary international law to constitute use cogens norms, state practice must be extensive and virtually uniform. So in these two cases of slavery and genocide, it is. Crime of aggression. This is very um, controversial one, and this is a very big deal concerning this current conflict. <clears throat> the crime of aggression was only prosecuted at Nuremberg. It originates from Nuremberg. It was never prosecuted in the former Yugoslavia because in the former Yugoslavia, it wasn't only until later that they were recognized as different states. It was originally treated as if it was a civil war. Um, it is um, prohibited against the Charter of the United Nations, Article 2, um, Section 4, which of course Russia and Ukraine are both signatories to. It prohibits the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state. Two exceptions were made. Firstly, individual or collective self-defense by states involving the use of force is authorized by Article 51, so self-defense. Um, this use of force, the second exception is the use of force authorized by the UN Security Council. So if you'll remember when uh, the US wanted to do the operation in Iraq, they went to the Security Council to get permission to do that. They didn't present. <laughs> everything legally, but that's, that's, that's how you do it. You have to go to the Security Council under Article 42 of the UN Charter and say there's an essential need um, for, um, for a country or for a group of countries to get militarily involved. General Assembly Resolution 3314, 1974, definition defines aggression. So this concept was created in the UN Charter in the 40s. It becomes much more um, defined and fo a focus in uh, 1974. It's aggression as the use of armed force by a state against the sovereignty, territorial integrity, or political independence of another state or in any other manner inconsistent with the Charter of the United Nations as set out in this definition. Article three defines what are aggressive acts invasion or attack by the armed forces of a state or territory, bombardment by the armed forces of the state or territory of another state, the act of a state allowing its territory to be used by another state for committing an act of aggression against a third state. So hypothetically, if a state near Russia allowed itself to be used, that state becomes as culpable as the original state, sort of like a conspiracy theory in individual liability. Um, and the sending of armed bands or mercenaries by the state to commit acts of armed forces against that state is also considered an aggressive act. This, the crime, the crime of aggression grew when it came time in 2010 to the establishment of the International Criminal Court. It stated in Article 5 of its establishing document, the ICC has jurisdiction over the crime of aggression. However, the second paragraph of Article 5 sets out this jurisdiction can only be exercised once a provision is adopted defining the crime and setting out the conditions under which such jurisdiction shall be exercised. So they knew when they set up the ICC that they wanted the crime of aggression, but they didn't yet know exactly how they wanted to define it. It went, they went on to create an amendment, Article 8, which states the planning, preparation, initiation, or execution by a person in a position effectively to exercise control over or to direct the political or military action of a state of an action or aggression, which by its carity, gravity, and scale constitutes a manifest violation of the Charter of the United Nations. ICC can only charge the crime of aggression uh, against a signatory to the Rome Statute. So the United States, Russia, China, all of the countries that have not signatories to the ICC's Rome Statute can never be charged with a crime of aggression. So it's not possible to charge this um, against um, Russia. So where would you take these crimes? If you, if you find that the Geneva Convention is being violated, if you find that genocide is occurring, if you find that um, the Hague Convention, any of these things are occurring, where would you go? The first 
um, it can it can happen in in these four places, the ICJ. So we have a first step that was taken, um, I think only two weeks ago by the ICJ um, and a decision came out yesterday. We'll discuss that. Then we have the International Criminal Court, which is open an investigation into Russia. Then we have um, ad hoc UN courts, such as the ICTY, the Yugoslav Tribunal, the Rwanda Tribunal. Um, and then you have the option, which is being pushed, pushed by a number of academics and is being pushed a lot by the United Kingdom an independent Nuremberg-like court. The ICJ. So the ICJ has historically um, takes enormous time to review something and to make a decision. And what is happening in this filing by Ukraine has literally changed history. The ICJ was basically considered like the Vatican. Like you go in with a question on morality and 150 years later, you get a decision. Um, this is so much history is being made right now in front of us um, on, uh, uh, I think February 28th, the, um, the Ukraine, uh, Ukraine filed a um, review, a request for the ICJ to review um, Russia's uh, classification of the acts in Crimea and Donbass region as um, war, uh, genocide. And uh, Ukraine stated that the reason that Russia has come into Ukraine is because they're alleging genocide. So they wanted the ICJ to state that genocide was not occurring and that genocide is not a reason for um, any incursion onto their territory. And finally, their request was that, um, they had a number of requests, but the one that passed was that, um, that, uh, that Russia stop immediately its involvement in Ukraine and that the parties stop fighting. Um, the decision is very interesting. It was unanimously passed. There is There are two dissenting opinions, one by um, the Russian, uh, I think he's the vice president, Grigoriev, um, and one by the Chinese um, judge. So not surprising. Um, <laughs> but the Russians, uh, very interestingly, um, I don't know how much of you are um, aware of a writer um, and uh, analyst in the United States of Russian origin, uh, Masha Gessen. She is from the start been saying that a lot of what um, Russia is hooked on is on NATO's actions in Kosovo and that all of this sort of anger against NATO stems from this. In fact, the Russian judge mentions as his one of his significant points for dissenting that uh, the ICJ was not allowed to review the NATO actions in Serbia. Um, so that's uh, very interesting um, that that's again being pulled up, but the final decision by the ICJ and they did not review whether genocide occurred or not. They did not think that that was relevant. They um, based their decision on the fact that Russia should not have started an attack unilaterally, that, that Russia should have gone to the Security Council and presented it and gotten Security Council approval. Um, so based on that violation, um, there was no reason uh, that there was no legal authority for whether genocide was occurring or not. There was no legal authority um, for Russia to enter. So they ruled by a 13 to 2 vote that Moscow must ensure that any military or regular armed units, which may be directed or supported by it, as well as any organization of persons which may be sub subject to its control or direction, take no steps in furtherance of the military operations referred to in point. So they made a decision that Russia has to stop this immediately. Um, this is binding. Um, I think I had a question about whether it's possible to enforce this. Uh, it is possible for this to be bounced back to the UN as the ICJ is a court of the UN and for peacekeeping operations to open um, some sort of, uh, that's the only um, military authority that they have um, to do a peacekeeping operation. So other than that, um, there is not much that the states can do. Um, and of course, Russia is on the Security Council, so that will not happen. Again, the ICJ decision 
is only for the state responsibility. It cannot look whether a leader or a military official is responsible. That is not within their jurisdiction. Um, and there's this decision, they say specifically that their decision now um, doesn't bias them from looking at um, issues in the Ukraine and between Ukraine and Russia in the future. Uh, Russia, Ukraine also asked for um, military, um, uh, sorry, uh, financial retribution, and they did not rule on that. They did not give uh, Ukraine that. So that can be brought up later in the future. So February 28th, 2022, Prosecutor Kareem Khan, the Chief Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, opens an investigation into Russia for war crimes. How did this happen? Neither Russia nor Ukraine are signatories to the Rome Statute. However, in 2014, the Ukraine invited the ICC to investigate in 20, um, to investigate the actions of Russia and its territory. The ICC sat on that. They sat on the Georgia investigation and the Ukraine investigation, which numerous lawyers, numerous individuals, um, uh, legal authorities in Ukraine, in Georgia, found to be disgusting and uh, upsetting. They sat on this and made no decisions and didn't proceed. But now that this action has happened, they're using the 2014 investigation to um, enter and to use that as a basis of jurisdiction. So by the Ukraine inviting in 2014, the ICC is stating that they have de facto accepted the ICC's jurisdiction on its territory. Further, a non-signatory state can be referred to the ICC by member countries. In the case of Ukraine, 39 international criminal, co criminal court member states referred the conflict to the Ukraine, to the ICC. So sort of two bases for the ICC investigating. Investigators are on the ground. What I've heard is that they're um, not in Ukraine, they're in Poland. Um, they're working in, and interviewing people coming in on the border. Um, the ICC cannot charge a non-signatory nation with crime of aggression. So they could be charged with violations of Geneva Convention, Hague Convention, customary international law, but they cannot be charged um, with the crime of aggression. An ad hoc court, this will not happen. There is no way, um, first of all, it, the only way that the Yugoslav Tribunal and all of the other UN ad hoc courts are established are by a resolution of the Security Council. As long as Russia is on the Security Council, this will not happen. This is the reason why there is no ad hoc investigating Syria, because Russia and China blocked it. Um, so that's not going to happen. Um, independent court. So there is a call by legal experts and NGOs to create an independent, independent court in the model of Nuremberg to prosecute the crimes in Ukraine. This would allow for the prosecution of the crime of aggression. That's the main reason they want to um, have this independent court, because it will allow the crime of aggression to be prosecuted. While the ICC can and should investigate war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide committed by all parties in Ukraine, under current circumstances, it cannot investigate the alleged crime of aggression. The International Court of Justice and European Court of Human Rights may have roles to play in Ukraine, but also cannot hold individuals accountable for the crime of aggression. So a new international or hybrid tribunal man mandated to investigate and prosecute the alleged crime of aggression in Ukraine could address this gap. There are various precedents to draw on for setting up such a tribunal, which could be complementary to other uh, proceedings. So they're not saying this would be the only place. Um, both the ICC, there would still be a place for ICC, there would still be a place for universal jurisdiction. Um, uh, I, did not put that in, but universal jurisdiction is also happening. Germany has opened an investigation into um, Russia and into the actions in Ukraine. This will, um, this is beginning now. And if they have, um, you know, any individuals that they can charge with that, they will begin a case. Um, they could also begin it um, in absentia. So it's, um, this is all different ways that um, this can happen. My last slide, this I showed to my students <laughs> when we study Nuremberg, because there's this concept always about, you know, these Western ideals, these Western rules of the UN and da da da. 
the Russia and the USSR were instrumental in bringing together Nuremberg, the UN Charter, the creation of the UN Declaration of Human Rights and International Human Rights. And I stated before his, in history, um, you know, in the Imperial Russia, they created the, they were behind the creation of the Hague, um, uh, the Hague Convention. So there is a history in Russia of and the Soviet Union um, of being involved in the creation. And I'm not saying this now as why they should be held accountable, why that they should be held to this high standard because they were part, they created these rules. I'm saying that there is a history that people in Russia should be proud of and should be defending and that it should be considered a part of um, your culture and not um, be looked at as sort of this, you know, person who this this country that um, is refusing to um, although it is a person uh, <laughs> refusing to um, follow and abide by um, international standards <laughs>